Hello. Welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worshiping with us. Would you join me in a word of prayer for our time in the scriptures? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would, by your spirit, enlighten our hearts and minds that we might understand your word, illuminate it before us that we could learn from you. Uh, we could learn more about who you are and more about who we are. Lord, um, bless us. Bless this time in your scriptures, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I first moved to the Eastern Shore, it, it didn't take me too long to recognize that the community here was divided into uh, categories. And those categories were come here's and from here's. I, of course, am a come here. I came here September of 2019, and I soon learned that it doesn't matter how long I intend to live here, I will never be a from here. I might at some point in my life graduate to a been here, but I will never be a from here. Now, uh, I, why do these distinctions occur in our community or any community for that matter? Well, oftentimes I think they occur in order to protect cultures and, and the way of life of a certain place. Um, come here's, uh, they come in all sorts of uh, with all sorts of ideas, right, that they bring to this place. Uh, they bring their ideas from where they lived before, and, and they want to import some of those things into the culture of the Eastern Shore. Now, from here's are happy with the way things are, uh, the way they've always been, and they don't want come here's with their newfangled ideas coming in and, and changing the way things have always been because we like it that way. Now, of course, these are generalizations and there's always exceptions to the rule, but the rule is there nonetheless. Uh, we see examples of this all over the world, actually. We see, uh, we as people tend to have this uh, tendency to, to create groups of us versus them. You know, we've got it in, in politics, Democrats versus Republicans, vegetarians versus carnivores, dog people versus cat people, breast versus bottle, Coke versus Pepsi. In fact, I was talking to a friend this week who is soon to be married, and he said that one of the things that drew him to his wife is that uh, she is like him in that she refuses to eat the end pieces of a loaf of bread because, and I quote, people who do that are psychopaths, <laughs> all right? Now, sure, some of these groupings are more for fun and others are more serious. Uh, and most of the time, I, I would encourage us to be aware uh, of when we find ourselves making these groupings. I, I would discourage us from having an us versus them mentality. But there are times when it is appropriate to have insiders and outsiders. Now, these, uh, these kind of questions, when is it appropriate to have insiders and outsiders, um, these kind of questions would most certainly have been on the minds of the exiles who were returning to their homeland from Babylon. And, and we'll see uh, the part that these people and these groups play throughout Ezra and Nehemiah. But particularly, we'll see it in today's passage. And for today's passage, I'll be biting off the entire second chapter of Ezra, uh, and, and so um, because it is uh, uh, such a long passage, I won't read through it all at the beginning, but instead I'll, I'll break it up into chunks and, uh, and, and then we will take those a little bit at a time. I'll make some comment on each section. But as we read through this passage, um, I want us to have our attention drawn to this question of us versus them. And I want us to look at three things that we see about those who fall inside the category of God's people, the us, God's people. And those three things are, I want us to notice the continuity of God's people and how that shows faithfulness. I also want God's people, I want us to see that God's people are set apart for worship. And finally, I want us to see that God's people are generous. Okay, so let us now look at Ezra Chapter 2, God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. Now, these were the people 
of the province who came up out of captivity, of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Yeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Baana. Now, already I'm going to take a break. Uh, this, this, this first verse and a half that we've already looked at here, there's a couple things to notice. First and foremost, it's that names matter, all right? People matter, all right? And, and there's a, a lot more uh, names that we're going to come in contact with in this passage, all right? So the names here uh, wouldn't be listed if they didn't matter. And so by listing these names, Ezra is, is putting specifics to the what in the past would have been thought of as vague promises of God, right? Jeremiah and Isaiah promise. We have prophecies that promise from God that the people of God would be returned to the promised land after their exile. Well, these names put names and faces to that promise. They prove that God's promise is being fulfilled. And these are, are real people. So if you think about when it gets to be Ezra's time, Ezra's recording this from the past. Um, he comes decades later. When it gets to be his time, he can say, listen, we need to keep this work going for the sake of these people. These are real people who sacrificed big parts, big chunks of their life uh, to, to be a part of what we are now a part of. So let's take that seriously. Another thing to notice is that there are 11 names listed here, all right? And this is kind of a list of leaders. So if you add the name Sheshbazar, which came in the last chapter, then you have 12 leader names. Now, this is not a coincidence, I think, all right? This list of 12 leaders should immediately make us think of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, as I mentioned last week, we're, we're starting to think of the people of God as Israel again. Remember, it was a divided kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom and Judah was the southern kingdom. Um, but before they were ever divided, they were considered to be Israel. And Israel is the name that God had given to Jacob after he had wrestled with God. And Israel means wrestles with God. And it kind of shows that relationship, that intertwining of God and his people. And so when we hear the word Israel, we are thinking God's people. All right, and here we see Israel in her fullness, no longer divided, but complete in her 12 tribes. All right, this also creates a continuity between the people of God from the past to the people of God in the present and the future. Now, that continuity is a big part of this whole book. All right, so picking up here, halfway through verse 2, we see a list of lay people. And notice that they are called the people of Israel, not Judah or Jerusalem or anything else, but they are Israel. So here we are picking up halfway through verse 2. The number of men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Arah, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Yeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Benai, 642. The sons of Bebai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Adonikam, 666, the sons of Bigvi, 2056, the sons of Aden, 454, the sons of Atter, namely of Hezekiah, 98, the sons of Bezai, 323, the sons of Jorah, 112, the sons of Hashem, 223, the sons of Gebar, 95, the sons of Bethlehem, 123, the men of Netophah, uh, 56, the men of An Anathoth, 128, the sons of Asmaveth, 42, the sons of Kiriath, Kiriath Aram, Shephira, and Beeroth, 
743. The sons of Rama and Giba, 621. The men of Mikmas, Mikmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Harim, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345, and the sons of Sena'a, 3,630. Man, we want, might want to say the sons of Oh No, just because I had to read so many names. Oh No. Anyway, in, in this list, there's a couple things that should stand out to us. One is that the people are listed by family and place. All right, these repeated phrases that we hear, the sons of, and the men of show us that family and place are important when it comes to the people of God, specifically Israel. All right, our God is a God of relationship. He entered into relationship by his covenant with a family, and he promised them specific places. And when the tribes were divided into the 12 tribes, each tribe received a certain inheritance, a certain piece of of land or responsibility. Now the continuity of these families returning to these places shows that our God is faithful, all right? He had promised these people, their families, certain plots of land, and now he is counting them, he is numbering them, and he is returning them to that land, all right? So that's the first thing we should notice. Second, there are a couple of names that should stand out to us. One is Joab, all right? Joab was King David's sister's son and the captain of David's armies, his general. All right, so that's one name we should notice. Another name is Hezekiah, all right? One of Judah's reformer kings, one of the kings who tried to pull the people back away from idolatry and towards Yahweh. Now, not only is there, uh, do we see a, an ancestral continuity of those returning to the land here, those who were from the family who came out of Israel and are now coming back, but we also see that there might be some continuity in the royal line as well with the mention of these um, particular names. Now, we pick up in verse 36 with a new list. This is a list of priests. The priests, the son of Jedidiah of the house of Yeshua, 973. The sons of Emer, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247 the sons of Harim, 1,017. Now here the thing to notice is the numbers. Of the 42,000 people returning, over 4,200 of them are priests. That's 10% of the people. Uh, imagine if one in 10 of us was a pastor. I mean, that might signal the value that we put into worship, right? Right? Uh, or, or at least into uh, caring for the people. And, and, and as we pick up in verse 40, we'll see that the remaining lists are also people who help with the temple worship. All right, they're, they're not listed with the lay people, but are given their own separate lists. I think that's something important. These people who have roles to play in the worship of Israel. So picking up in verse 40, the Levites, the sons of Yeshua and Kadmiel, of the sons of Hodaviah, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talman, the sons of Echub, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Shobai, in all 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tabaoth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sihaha, the sons of Padon, the sons of Lebana, the sons of Hagaba, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Reahiah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uza, the sons of Paseah, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of 
Meunim, the sons of Nephesim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harhur, the sons of Basluth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Neziah, and the sons of Hatipha. Now, the list of the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasophereth, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jaala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pachareth Hazebaim, and the sons of Ammi. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. All right, we'll take another break here from this list. Did you notice that there were three lists in there? There were the Levites, there were the temple servants, and then there were the sons of Solomon's servants. Now, each list is given in kind of a descending importance. Levites, most importance. The sons of Solomon's servants, least importance. And yet, they are separated as important because they play a part in temple worship. In fact, the sons of Solomon's servants were likely slaves. They were likely prisoners of war. They were likely foreigners, right? Many of the names on this list are foreign names. Well, to us, they're all foreign names. But what I'm saying is that these, some of these names are foreign to Israel. And, and the thing to remember here is that these foreigners were listed in this first set of lists. There's more lists to come. Yeah, get excited. All right, there's more lists to come, but these foreigners are in the first set of the lists. These foreigners were, in a sense, naturalized. They were part of Israel. They were um, given a place amongst the people and in these lists. And so, while name and place is important to Israel, there is an inclusiveness to Israel. And this is an inclusiveness that has been from the very beginning. When God made his covenant with Abraham, he told him that his family would be a light to the nations, meaning they would be a beacon that would draw foreigners into the worship of Yahweh. And when God spoke to Moses, he gave him, in the law, a naturalization process for the converts to become a part of Israel. Israel has always been intended to be a group of people with diverse ethnicity, but pure in worship. So when we start talking about intermarriages and how God is against intermarriages, he's not talking about intermarriage between ethnicities. God's not against that. But he is against intermarriage between religions. In fact, the book of Ruth is an entire book of the Bible celebrating a mixed ethnicity marriage where Ruth, the hero of the story, you could say, well, God's the hero, but the, the main character in the book of Ruth, the one who the book is named after, is a foreigner. But she was a worshiper of Yahweh. And so she was accepted into the people. All right, that is the key. It's important for us to understand this distinction as we head into the next section, which is a list of people who are, in some form, considered outsiders. They're not able to prove their continuity with pre-exile Israel, and so they are listed separately, okay? So that's where we pick up here in verse 59. The following were those who came up from Tel Malah, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of of Tobiah and the sons of Nekoda, 652. Now these were the lay people who couldn't prove their descent, but now in this next list, we're gonna be looking at a list of priests who couldn't prove their descent, all right? Which was of much more importance to a priest, right? Because you had to be descended from the line of Aaron in order to be a priest. So look at verse 61. Also, the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. 
The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. Okay, so there's a number of things that we need to note here. First, Barzillai. It's another name that we might recognize. Might, might not. But Barzillai, the Gileadite, was a man who helped King David when David was fleeing from his rebellious son, Absalom. He brought David supplies. He offered David an escort. And after that, David, after he defeated Absalom, he promised Barzillai a home in the palace. And he charged his son Solomon to show kindness to Barzillai's sons in 1 Kings 2.7. Now, one of the commentators I read said that even though these men that are in this list won't get special treatment since they are in this list of, of the undocumented, nonetheless, their connection to David's court should raise an eyebrow. Okay. Now, the next thing to notice is that these sons of priests are excluded from the priesthood as unclean. Now, a number of commentators that I read pointed out that this is a bit of a weak translation. The word is more accurately rendered desecrated or deposed, right? This removal from the priesthood is a serious thing. And the reason for it is made clear by the word unclean. You see, the purpose for this separation between the documented and the undocumented is an overabundance of caution concerning religious purity. Now, we have to remember why Israel was sent into exile in the first place. It was because they had succumbed to the pressures of this world. They had intermarried with pagan worshipers and they had begun to worship idols themselves. They had been unfaithful to Yahweh. And so it's absolutely fitting that in their return, they would take an abundance of caution concerning religious purity. And unfortunately, the only way they had to do that was through documentation through connection to the continuity of the pre-exilic Israelites. Now, in this time of the first return, all the way to today, we have no real way of knowing if someone is a genuine worshiper of Yahweh. We kind of have to just take their word for it. Now, now, we do a little bit more than that. To become a member of this church in particular, you have to make a credible profession of faith, um, explain what you believe and why, basically. Um, and you need to take solemn vows regarding that faith. Um, and, and, and that's what you have to do in order to become a, a member of the church. This is to guard the purity of the church because the church should be only made up of people who truly believe and worship Yahweh. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and that's all we can do to maintain the purity of the church. Now, the leaders of this first return back to Jerusalem were even more stringent, and they required documentation, all right, like this, to show this continuity. However, I want you to notice that these people, even though they are undocumented, they are still allowed to return to Jerusalem. They're just merely categorized differently. And there was still hope for their reinstatement. If you look at the priests in verse 63, it says that these people were to refrain from any priestly activity, specifically eating the food that the priests were to eat, until a priest could consult the Urim and Thummim. Now, the Urim and Thummim were tokens used as lots, right, to determine the will of God. Essentially, like some kind of holy magic eight ball, a priest would ask a yes or no question to God. Um, like, is this person who claims to be in the priestly line, are they legit? And then he would reach into uh, his priestly vestments and he would pull out one of these lots, a Urim or a Thummim, and that would give him the answer to his question because God is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over which is drawn out. And so the priest would have his answer depending on which one he pulled out of this container in his vestments. Now, I'll point out that we should not consult God's will in this way for two reasons. One, notice they don't do it right away here, all right? They have to wait until a priest who is descended from Aaron and is serv serving in the reestablished temple, they have to wait for that person to do this thing, all right? This is something that only these priests could do. And two, this method of, of divining God's will ceased with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. 
we don't need to cast lots anymore. We have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But at this point, um, the point is here that there was a hope, right, for some of these people that they could be restored to priestly office if God could confirm them. Now, likewise, our denomination has a, a rigorous process for determining a man's fitness for pastoral office. Now, it's not a perfect system, but it goes a long way to prevent religious impurity in our church. And, and, and this was the point of these two different lists that were separated from the other returnees, all right? Rightly, the people are trying to preserve religious purity in this remnant who are returning to Jerusalem. Now, we turn to the conclusion of the lists. Look at verse 64. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom <coughs> there were 7,300 and 37, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their donkeys were 6,720. Now here I'll just point out that there were some returnees, clearly wealthy enough to own slaves, to have servants, and to have horses and camels, etc., now, there were others who only had donkeys, and donkeys were much more affordable at that time. All right, so that's just something to notice that we have an a, a, um, economic gap in this group of returnees. Now, look at verse 68. Some of the heads of the family, when they came to the house of the Lord, that is in Jerusalem, made freewill offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury, treasury of the work. 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minus of sil silver, 100 priests' garments. Now, I know these units of measure mean nothing to us, but let's just say that this is a generous sum, all right? That it, and that's the focus here, um, that they are being generous in giving to the house of God. Now, uh, Haggai, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, in his prophecy, he's prophesying at this time, around this time, we see that Haggai the prophet scolds the people for living in fine houses while the temple is still in ruins. Yet, we see this here as a generous action. And, and since there were some rich and some who were not as rich, notice they gave according to their ability. This is all that God requires of us. Generosity that is com commensurate with our ability. Okay? Picking up in, in verse 70. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns and all the rest of Israel in their towns. Now this concludes the chapter showing that God's faithfulness to safely get these people back and living in their towns is, it, it can be trusted that God did what he promised he would do. Now, it should also be noted that the returnees are called Israel here at the end again. It, it kind of bookends this idea of God's faithfulness to his faithful remnant of people. Well, now that we've gone through the text, I want to just briefly revisit the three main takeaways. Because a lot of times people will look at a list like this, they'll skip right over it, and they will take nothing from it. But of course, we know that all scripture is God-breathed, including lists like these and genealogies, and they're useful, all right? So let's talk about the usefulness of this list. The first thing that we take away is the continuity of God's people and how that shows faithfulness, both of the people and of God. Now, Ezra is trying to show this continuity all throughout this scroll, okay? Uh, and, and he wants to show the continuity between pre- and post-exile Israel. This is uh, connected to the families and land, of course, that we talked about, but it also includes foreigners in the count, all right? These 12 leaders representing the 12 tribes is a key that shows this motif of continuity. Now, God is faithful to his covenant people. He is just as faithful to his people who returned as he is to those who stayed in Babylon. But... It is through these returnees that the temple will be rebuilt. 
It is these returnees, not the people who stayed, who are listed here. <coughs> That's important. It isn't necessarily that God is more faithful to the faithful remnant who returned, but it's these people who were faithful, who stepped out in faith, who get to participate in what God is doing. Okay, that's big. For us, I think it's crucial that we see the continuity between the faithful remnant of Israel and the church, the church of Christ. All right, the New Testament talks about this a lot. It says that we, the church, the Gentiles, have been grafted into Israel. It says that the true Israel is not necessarily those who are descendants of Abraham physically, but those who are justified by faith as he was. Now, some theologians and denominations would put a heavy emphasis on actual physical national Israel as playing a big part in God's story, especially in the end. But I think that's misreading scripture's intent. We need to recognize that we are the people of God. If we believe in Jesus, if we believe in Yahweh, Jesus being one uh, third of the, not the third because I would divide it, one of the three persons of the Trinity, uh, if we worship him, uh, then we are part of God's people. Uh, and just as he was faithful to his people in the past, as we see here in Ezra, he will be faithful to us. Therefore, like these people, we should be able to step out in faith. Okay? Now, we don't have a physical temple to go and make a pilgrimage to in order to rebuild. We have a place. We could rebuild it. Some people think that it needs to be rebuilt. But even if we did go there to you know, build the, rebuild the temple, I don't think that's what God actually wants. In fact, he tells us in the New Testament that we are the temple. Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles are the foundation. And, and we each are a stone laid into this living temple. How do we then build this temple? We do it by getting more stones to be laid on top of others. And, and we all know what that means. And, and I'll be honest, we know that evangelism is scary. But so was leaving your home in Babylon where you'd been for 70 years and returning to the promised land where you had nothing guaranteed. Now this faithful remnant, they needed to step out in faith. They needed to trust God. They needed to, to do something difficult. And, and I've told you many times about how when we were putting together our mission and vision for this church, that people told me that our slogan, go, gather, and grow, was in the wrong order. We needed to put go at the end, right? You, you know, you got to gather and then grow before you can go. But I insisted that this is not the case. The list in chapter 2 of Ezra here, I think, is only further proof that we have it in the right order. When God calls people to go, they must step out in faith. And yes, he equips them along the way as they grow as they rely on God, but he always calls them to go first. Friends, I believe we are the people of God. If you are a part of the church, if you worship Jesus, you are part of the people of God. That means we ought to be going, right, somewhere, not necessarily making a pilgrimage, picking up, packing our house up and going, but we ought to be engaging with our community, right? We ought to be gathering stones for God's new temple by sharing the good news of the gospel. We ought to be sharing it, you know, by the way we live, but also sharing it verbally, this message of the gospel. Because it's only the gospel that can gather people into a true and pure worshiping church. Which brings us to our next observation. <coughs> God's people are set apart for worship. Remember from the lists, the large focus on those who assist with worship, the Levites, the servants, the priests, everyone else that were all in these lists. Even the least servant was considered important to record. Even the slaves that had been captured um, through foreign wars who had become to faith in Yahweh were listed in this record. There's a distinction between those who are in and those who are out, and yet... There are many foreign names who are in. 
You see, purity in the worshipers of Yahweh is important, yet all are welcome to be worshipers of Yahweh. We cannot look at a person and know if they are a true worshiper of Yahweh. There isn't a mark on their forehead that sets them apart, but there are clues. You know, I think about um, this scene from the movie, uh, Quentin Tarantino movie, Inglorious Bastards, where Americans are posing as Nazi soldiers and they're having a drink with Nazi soldiers and they're doing everything right. They're speaking with the right accent. They're doing everything right to blend in and play the part. That is until one of them tries to order more drinks by holding up his index finger and his middle finger to sig signify two. Yeah, get us two more. Well, that gives him away immediately because in Germany, when you want to signal two, you would hold up your thumb and index finger. And it's little details like this that betray a person's culture and more importantly, betrays their allegiance. Jesus said that true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. If we are truly God's people, if we are his righteous remnant, our lives will be marked by our worship. Now, I want to be abundantly clear here that if there is any place in the world that is open to come here, it's the church of Jesus Christ. We want those who were down and out. We want the horrible sinners. We want the social outcasts. We want the foreigners and the illegal aliens. We want all the people who the world would shun. But we want them to love Jesus. All right? Maintaining the peace and purity of the church, part of that is, is making sure that the people love Jesus. And part of that sometimes involves discipline. But for those of us who are truly in love with Jesus, who are truly repentant of sin, uh, um, th then being disciplined and repenting would be a natural thing for us. We should love God's word. We should be eager to obey and quick to repent when we fall. And we'll all fall, but we should be quick to repent. This is what we should look like. But the church has a way of attracting for lack of a better word, Pharisees, people who like to talk the talk and even like to look like they have their act together <clears throat> on the outside. But deep down, they're selfish and defensive and only part of the church for what they can get out of it. Maybe prestige or maybe friendship. Again, it's hard for us to know when that's the case in someone. And this is why we have church courts to adjudicate when sin problems arise in people. But we should all examine ourselves with this criteria. Are we in the church for some other reason than we love Jesus? If that's the case, we should repent right now and ask for forgiveness and throw ourselves upon the mercy that he has for us. And he has it in abundance. Be a true worshiper who lets their love for Jesus affect every aspect of their being. Which brings us to one of those aspects, which is our, uh, in our text today, highlights, which is that God's people are generous. Yes, this means that we are to be generous with our money, but it also means that we are to be generous with our time, with our talents, and our energy. When we come to church, do we, do we come only to receive or do we come to serve? I mean, it's okay to receive sometimes. We all need to receive. We all need to be blessed by each other. But we're also called to give. Are we in a church because it has the programs that we want that meet our needs? Or are we in a church because these are the people God has called us to love and serve? Are we part of a church because it's, a, it's comfortable for us there? Or because we are challenged to love and serve Jesus more and more, even to the point where it might become uncomfortable? Our passage today said that the returnees gave according to their ability. But what does that mean? I mean, the exemplar that Jesus holds up in the New Testament is a widow who gave her last coin. The only thing that gave her the ability to give was having that coin. It was the last thing she had. Now, it might not have been a fiscally responsible action, 
but it was sacrificial. And I think that sacrifice is what God is calling us to. That's the kind of generosity that God calls his people to. And he does it by his own example. What did God give generously for us? What did the creator of the universe, who really owns every cattle on every hill, what did he give us? He gave us his one and only son, the person who was most precious to him. He gave to become one of us and to die for us. God didn't just slip a big check into the offering plate to assuage his conscience. He gave his very life. And if we are true worshipers, if we are truly the people of God, our lives will mirror that gesture. We will be self-giving people who go outside of their comfort zones to bless others with what we have been given. And we have been given the greatest gift of all time, the gift of life through faith in Jesus Christ. We have this to offer in unlimited supply. But the giving itself is difficult. It requires us to give of ourselves. But this is what we do if we are the people of God. This is what the righteous remnant of God's people are spurred to do because of who we are in Jesus. We are faithful because he was faithful to us. We love and we worship because of his love for us. And we give generously because he first gave to us. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have met us here in your word, even in this difficult chapter, a, a, a list of people's names and places and numbers that to most of us means just about nothing. But God, you are faithful to show us that every name matters. Every name matters. And that being people of God matters. And being genuine people of God matters. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make this church, uh, this visible church, you would make it full of only those invisible church members. That you would uh, separate the the wheat from the chaff in our midst. That we would have a, a, a church full of those who love Jesus and, and, and no Pharisees. But, Lord, even though that's not always the case, we pray that you would give us wisdom as we deal with with those differences, and that we would even share the gospel well enough that Pharisees could turn into believers like they did in the New Testament. Lord God, let your gospel go forth from us so clearly and so winsomely that the people are drawn into your temple, your living temple, the church, which is continuous from the Israel of God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.